Hi there, everybody. Thought I'd start off with a little musical um, intro there, something that I, uh, I wrote, and actually I, I recorded that just before speaking to uh, Eric Jose in the very, very early hours of Monday morning. My alarm clock was set for, for 4.30 so that I could catch him at 5, and then, as usual, there was a, there was a delay, and it was basically 6 o'clock in the morning till 7 o'clock in the morning, so... It's taken me ages to <laughs> to recover from that, but it's always it's always good to have a chat with the uh, with the dude as I call him and uh, the the Aussie Mark. It's always it's good to to catch up for them and we we do chatter chat away a lot um, and a lot of time we talk about the control question. Uh, one or two people have actually asked about the control question and why it's why it why is it so important you know why focus on the control question when there were so many other aspects of Brendan's uh, uh, wrongful confession it wasn't even a, a confession it was just uh, nodding the head and agreeing with the, the rubbish that that was fed to him by uh, we get in fast vendor um, and yeah th there are other aspects obviously to the confession that we could have you know we could have focused in on um, to be honest Eric Jose had always maintained that this control question um, was something of interest to him and that was long before the on bank judges but long before the judge Hamilton even quoted it himself in his majority decision. That shows you just how important this control question was. And as I say, Eric Cozy was highlighting the, the issue, the nonsensical um, issue of, of this uh, you know, the control question that clearly proves the opposite, that Brendan's will was being overborne by these, uh, by these investigators. Um, and, you know, <laughs> Eric Cozy and I, we don't always agree on everything. Um, some of you will be well aware of our Captain Crunch debate, which um, which got quite heated. Um, it got to the extent where we even got um, Mark Hodinett to act as judge. He became Judge Wilfox, and uh, in typical um, crass uh, Wisconsin judge style, uh, just before we were about to debate it, he then changed the goalpost. He added a, a Denny part to it, which was that Although Eric Jose had claimed that Captain Crunch was British, and I had simply claimed that he definitely wasn't British, and I thought I would be arguing on the fact of, of proving that Captain Crunch wasn't British, I then had this Denny presented with me that I had to then prove, try and prove that Captain Crunch was actually American. Uh, so they changed the goalposts, uh, typical Wisconsin fashion, that, uh, that judge, to, uh, you know, he needs to... Uh, he needs to explain eventually what uh, what was going on, both Will Fox and uh, Willis and uh, and Fox. Um, as I say, we don't we don't always see eye to eye on everything. Um, one of the things that that we had a, a very big debate over, and I am aware of the fact that some people would say, you know, with Americans, never ever discuss gun gun control it is too much of a big issue um but if if i could change if, if if there were things that we could change about america and and you know some fundamental things then uh, number one would be guns get rid of guns um you know this idea that, that a gun protects you uh well it doesn't protect you it kills somebody else um but it doesn't, you know, a, um, a bulletproof vest, that will protect you. Um, not getting into an argument about something in the first place, that might be a, a way of protecting yourself. But uh, uh, I think speaking from the rest of the world, talking to America, we, we, we would be saying, please, America, get rid of your guns. You know, don't have so many guns. Uh, you know, try and get rid of these, these gun, gun crimes, these appalling shootings, you know. Um, Anyway, there's there's a whole load of, of, of debate about that. Um, as I say, um, Eric Ozzy's got his point of view. Um, I've certainly got mine. And as I say, we, we don't always agree on everything. Um, secondly, the death penalty. Isn't it interesting? It wasn't actually mentioned either in, in, in Making a Murderer. How the... Well, it was, sorry, yes, it was mentioned in, in, episode, in the, the first part that there was even a call based on the... the, the, the um, simply the arrest 
of Stephen Avery, the, the being charged with this murder. There were calls for the death penalty to be brought back to Wisconsin. Um, and the timing of it meant that, that, that there could well have been a referendum right in the middle of the Avery trial. So, in other words, the jurors would have, would have left the, the jury room and gone and voted on a death penalty, inspired by, you know, the, the accusation that Stephen had done all these terrible things to uh, Theresa Holbeck. Um, the third thing, obviously, would be the um, changing of the, um, uh, the, the requirement, uh, the, the, the sort of verdicts of guilty and not guilty to guilty and not proven. Now, based particularly on the on the gun situation, I, I, I've had people come back to me, reasonable people have said, look, you know, um, we'd like to see get guns gotten rid of, but it's impractical. It, it, it just can't be done. You know, you are living in, I am living in a del delusional wonderland where, where I think that there could be no guns, no death penalty and guilty not proven. No, I don't live in wonderland. I live in Scotland. That's where I live. We have all of those, right? We don't have, you know, um, the, the, the problems that, uh, that, the, 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 the people throughout the world have, have realised are, uh, are really uh, dragging down um, America as, as far as, you know, its legal system um, and, and just, just so many things about it. And that's, that, that is a real shame because I, I really do, uh, since meeting and chatting with Eric Cozy and all the other wonderful supporters throughout America, you know, they, they, are, they are wonderful, wonderful people and they deserve, they deserve their great country to be even greater. And yet yeah, to, to lead the world and say, yeah, we, we, can, we, can, we can change things, you know, we can change things for the better. Things you know, like Eric Cozy was talking about yesterday and isn't it interesting, Kathleen Zellner also mentioned them, these um, conviction integrity units very, very important. Take away this, this adversarial uh, nonsense. I mean, talking about adversarial nonsense, the, the Ken Kratz still thinks that this is some sort of um, publicity campaign. Um, and I was quite pleased that uh, Kathleen Zellner has actually started to retaliate. Um, and sh she doesn't mince her words, does she, you know? Um, anyway, first of all, I fully accept, and as we all do, that Stephen Avery was no saint, or is no saint. Now, the way it's gone, he is definitely going to become a martyr, and therefore the patron saint of wrongful convictions. Um, but yeah, getting back to the, to the, to the gun issue, if, if guns weren't, weren't around, if, if Stephen Avery hadn't got a gun, then he would not have pointed it at Sandy Morris. Uh, just after the new year of 1985. You know, we hear about him. He followed her in her car, knocked off the road, pointed a gun at her. It's interesting, isn't it, that um, when Stephen Avery was eventually exonerated back in 2003, the actual figure that his um, uh, civil, civil t team Glenn and Kelly initially asked for was 1.2 million. I find that interesting because the the he did 18 years. So why not 1.8 million? Well, because of course the first six years were quite rightly served for pointing the gun at uh, Sandra Morris. And Stephen Avery will always be a convicted felon for having pointed the gun at her. Um, and of course, the 1.2 million, I think, re represents the fact that he was claiming $100,000 per year for being wrongfully convicted. Whereas, of course, you know, it was, it was 12 years that he did wrongfully convicted. And as, as we know, the, the, the last eight, um, absolute disgrace that they, uh, that they even knew that, uh, you know, they, they, they had, had very, very, very good evidence that Stephen Avery uh, was not the uh, the perpetrator of the attack on Penny, but of course, <laughs> the the intervening two years, I get the sense that yeah, Stephen, he probably he probably didn't conduct himself in the greatest of manner by by taking on this air of 
well, I've, I've been exonerated. I can do what I like. And, I, and I'm sure that knowing that he was going to be getting a lot of money, he, he rubbed people up the wrong way. Um, you know, <laughs> as I say, I'm, I'm never going to defend Stephen Avery and say he was a saint. But the problem is that as far as the, um, as far as the most, the majority of people in, in, in certainly in Manitrop and certainly the Sheriff's Department, the end justified the means. By framing Steve for the disappearance of Theresa Holbach, they shut that civil suit that was going to, going to be very, very damaging. They shut it down. Um, how did it escalate to uh, a claim for 36 million? I believe the fact that uh, because Gundrum came back and offered 460,000 um, and there was going to be no uh, retribution on the... Uh, on, on Manitrock Sheriff's Department. Um, now, of course, tomorrow, unfortunately, Mark marks 13 years since Theresa's disappearance. Um, it's interesting that the, that the one report that we do have of a, um, a, a bad smelling fire is the day after, four, four and a half miles away at Zander Road. And I would definitely advise, if you haven't done so already, check out Eric Hose's videos. It's in two parts, but just type in Eric Hose, Zander Road, it'll take you to both parts. Very, very interesting stuff. Particularly the fact that it, it was never followed up. There was never any, any um, further investigation done into Paul Metz's um, you know, being aware of a, of a very bad smelling fire, which caused you know, his, his own cows to, to start running around uh, in a frenzy. Um... I saw a couple of t tweets recently. Um, one, of course, by, by Steve Drizzen. Um, <laughs> and fair enough, okay. Um, he, he's saying, don't send me any any stuff thinking, claiming, you know, supporting the notion that, st that Theresa Holbrook is, is still alive. Show some decency. You know, it, it's, it, it, it's not nice for the family. Um, Unfortunately, it's the investigation into her disappearance which has caused, given people cause to think, well, we haven't even got a body. You know, we haven't even got those that were identified as being hers. And we've got Carmen Butwell, uh, you know, dying on the Wednesday of an, of an overdose. And then apparently her remains weren't handed back to the family for a month later. You know, we've got this strange death. There's so much ab about this. They have made such a mess of it. Honestly, you know, show some decency. Well, <laughs> it was the investigators. It's, the, it's them that have insulted the memory of Theresa Holbach. They, they, in their efforts to frame Stephen Avery, have, have completely and utterly insulted Theresa's memory. And finally, isn't it isn't it isn't it really annoying how the um, the the guilters are trying to create these two two lots of sympathisers? You're either a sympathiser on the side of the Holbacks, or you're a sympathiser on the side of the Averys. You know that's nonsense. We are sympathisers not only for the Averys, with the exception of possibly one or two members of, of, of Barb's immediate family who have got a lot of questions to answer. And likewise, the Holbucks, well, they've got a black sheep in the family. They've got Mike Holbuck grieving for, 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 her, for his sister when she's only a missing person. Um, anyway, I've kept you long enough. Um, catch you again soon. Bye for now.